In 1837, when Queen Victoria came to the throne, respectable Victorians looked forward to living in a moral and upstanding nation. But to their dismay, there would always be a different, ruder country. In rude Britannia, life was celebrated in music halls with bawdy humour and lewd songs. Outrageous! Stop it right now! <laughs> in rude Britannia, new technologies created mass-produced offence. The shock of the rude nude photograph. The comic whose boozy satirical star stuck two fingers up to polite society. No more of this filth! And in rude Britannia, you could enjoy the cheeky carnival of the seaside. A place of saucy peep shows and smutty picture postcards. Stick of rock, cock! <laughs> For over a hundred years, a war waged. On the one side, a naughty nation. On the other, a country of Victorian values, now claimed in the Queen's name with battle lines drawn. Who would win? Rude Britannia presents bawdy songs, lewd photos, and the most hand-wringing moral melodramas of Victorian values. Already, by the first years of Victoria's reign, Britain was experiencing extraordinary change, created by industrial revolution. Thousands were pouring into cities in search of work. Manchester grows to 300,000 people, Liverpool up to 260,000 people. This is a new civilization which the world hadn't seen before. In these cities, a new urban working class was born. And wherever they could, they created their own rude culture of pleasure, revelry and escape. What you really get is so many people living in an enclosed area and entertainment springing all around you. So you've got entertainment in the pub, you've got entertainment in the brothels, you've got entertainment on the fair, and it was everywhere, and anyone could do it. Rough and ready places for drink and song called penny gaffs exploded in numbers on the meanest of street corners. I'm in a mitted sample, Jim this week, Jim this week. I'm in a mitted sample, Jim this week. Enterprising people, not necessarily with a theatrical background, would take any vacant space in which uh, a rough stage could be put up and they would charge people a penny to come in and see it. Into these places would be crowded all the street people from the surrounding area, particularly the young, particularly young men. Uh, there, would, there would be drinking in these places. There'd be a lot of bawdy talk. There'd probably be sexual suggestiveness, maybe some sexual activity. In the penny gaffs, a rowdy crowd drank, laughed at lewd banter and sang along to rude, bawdy songs. Oh, the parson, he did come, and he looked so fucking glum, and he talked to kingdom come. Damn his eyes, damn his eyes, he can kiss my bleeding bum. Damn his eyes, oh, I went up over here. The working-class young were wage-earning from a very early age, certainly by the early teens. They had, if you like, a certain disposable income and they feature largely in the audience, often up in the balcony or the gallery, often noisy, etc. cetera. 
rude, common people were a threat to another class that also jostled for space and influence in the Victorian city. The middle class had a fierce belief in themselves as the guardians of public morality. The middle classes were rational and they were intelligent and they went to work on time and they looked after their families and they were dignified and they were the backbone of the Victorian, mid-Victorian moral culture in Britain. These were people who believed they were distinct from the working class, who were drunken, dissolute, you know, bestial. <coughs> they were clearly distinct from the upper class, who, you know, were interested in fox hunting and drinking and equally bestial pursuits. When middle class commentators steeled themselves to visit the Penny Gaffs, they were appalled. There can be no question that these places are no better than so many nurseries for juvenile thieves, the little rascals. The one cheers on the other in crime. Plans for thieving and robbing houses and shops are formed and promptly executed. Despite such disapproval and censure, the new rude culture of the cities went defiantly from strength to strength. You couldn't license it, you couldn't control it. Uh, it was on the edge of anarchy. And that was an, an anxiety, I think, that the middle classes had about the working classes for much of the 19th century. It was, uh, what do we do to control them? We don't want them going too far. We must keep them under control. By the 1850s, the backroom boardiness of the Penny Gaffs had evolved into the more recognisable form of the music hall. This world of song and dance was becoming the rude entertainment that would dominate the Victorian city for the rest of the century. The music hall comes from very humble origins. Essentially, the music hall begins with rooms set aside in pubs for people to have a bit of a sing-song around the piano. But gradually, those back rooms begin to, in a way, displace the pubs. You can see this, actually, in some of the surviving architectural examples. The Wilton's Music Hall in the East End of London is this small building that was the pub, with this giant hall appended to the back of it. From the mid-Victorian era, music halls were being built in every major city in Britain. From the beginning, rude, chaotic places. But unlike the Penny Gaffs, the music hall became a place of rudeness for both rich and poor. Here, aristocratic swells would slum it with the lower orders. This alliance of toffs and proles in shared love of a racy night out was a serious threat to Victorian values. As you may suppose, when you look at my clothes, I'm principal walking for swells. And the fellas I think it would surprise us because it wasn't the, the serried ranks of fixed seating facing the front. Uh, the crowd in the halls at this time were mixed, mobile and preoccupied with their own presence. They often sat at tables at right angles to the stage. There was a lot that was going on in the auditorium. There was drinking, eating, conversing, socialising, flirting. In fact, it was a great hubbub, and also there was the haze of tobacco smoke, which meant that the performers had to uh, be bold and assertive. They had to cut through this noise and the smoke, even to make themselves heard. So the early performers, their style was really a mix of, I don't know, singing and shouting. Crowds filled the early music hall to hear saucy songs which celebrated the rude delights of bed and bottle. And on stage, rude stars were created, none cheekier than George Laban and his alter ego, 
Champagne Charlie. I've seen a deal of gaiety throughout my noisy life. <laughs> With all my grand accomplishments, I ne'er could get a wife. <laughs> Charlie's whole act was a rude provocation. Labour was noted for the majestic sweep of his hand play. He postured and strutted. He was almost homo erectus, almost a walking kind of phallus. <gasps> From coffee and from supper rooms, from poplar to pell-mell, the girls on seeing me exclaim, oh, what a champagne swell. <laughs> Whoever drinks... He's a good time chap. He's got his eye open for the pretty girl. Uh, it's, all, it's a bit sexy, it's a bit naughty. His songs were about the drink culture. From dukes and lords to cabmen down, I make them drink champagne. Oh, Champagne Charlie is my name. Champagne Charlie. Champagne was the fashionable drink of the day. It had come down in price. Leyburn exemplified, embodied this new relish for champagne. He was provided with money from the champagne shippers to live the life of the swell off stage as well as on stage. Charlie's boozing was an affront to the aims of a Victorian temperance movement that saw the demon drink destroying the health and morals of the nation. This darker side to life in the cities was also revealed in songs that acknowledged a world of prostitution where the upper class took their pleasure with the poor. The thing I most excel in is the PRFG game. What did PRFG mean? It took me years to find this out. It meant private rooms for gentlemen a reference to these premises that were available to men who could take prostitutes there or other women for their assignations. Yes, Champagne Charlie is my name. <laughs> Flirting with taboo areas of Victorian life was one of the great attractions of Music Hall. And it was this prodding of sensitivities that allowed another rude performer to become a hit with audiences. Lydia Thompson was a star of Victorian burlesque, a style of popular theatre that used cross-dressing to subvert conventional gender roles. In Lydia's rude world, girls dressed up as boys. Lydia Thompson is probably one of the foremost figures in the history of burlesque itself. Lydia Thompson very much has earned her crown as one of the great queens of burlesque. <laughs> Lydia's early career, she was most famous at this point for her sailor boy dance, where she danced a sailor's hornpipe. Naturally, this meant that she was wearing trousers, and this meant that everyone could have a good look at her legs. Of course, it was celebrated as a terpsichorean delight, but you know, the audience knew better. Lydia's performance was a satirical dance of mockery. Every move and gesture poked fun at the Victorian male. Outrageous! Burlesque actually means humiliation of the male form through the female form, so we use the female form in terms of entertainment and nudity to humiliate the man. It's very much suggestive, it's very much funny, and it's almost, well, I suppose, what we call taking the piss out of it. It's, it is that form of entertainment. The way they would walk, the way they would stand and pose, perhaps a knowing look, a slow wink, maybe choosing an audience member and giving them a long, hard stare. 
You know, these would be typically masculine. These would be um, a strut, perhaps, perhaps a, a cocky walk. But of course, it was all about the shapely legs, the breeches, the tights, the ankles. And of course, over time, the breeches got shorter and uh, the costumes became increasingly exiguous. Lydia's gender-bending provoked a chorus of disapproval. She is neither male nor female, an alien sex parodying both. Music Hall had roots in a tradition of bawdy humour and song that went back centuries. But in the first decades of the Victorian age, a revolutionary medium arrived, a new technology to further undermine Victorian values. At first, it seemed photography would be a reputable art to capture those innocent moments of daily life. But pretty soon, in studios all over Britain, the clothes were coming off. Respectable Britain was most certainly not amused by all this nudity. The moral campaigners of the mid-19th century were, were, were outraged. Here was something completely new and very, very disturbing. But in the upper reaches of Victorian society, there was soon a taste for photographic rudeness. Edward Lindley Sanborn was a cartoonist for Punch, house journal of the respectable classes. In the pages of Punch, there was never the rude satirical cartooning of the previous Georgian era. Punch is a safe form of political criticism, of illustrated political criticism. You can criticize politicians, but you mustn't undermine politics. You can criticize the queen, but you don't undermine the monarchy. But when he wasn't creating safe, comforting humor, Sanborn was being a very naughty boy. Lily Sanborn had a hobby that rather dominated his life, really. When his wife and two children were away, he would have models in his studio and he would uh, photograph them in the new. <laughs> you can gauge how he felt about what he was doing by the fact that if you look at his diaries, he's always doing this when his wife is away in Ramsgate. Sanborn first had models pose for him when he was looking for inspiration for his punch cartoons seems to be almost like a slow motion strip tease where he starts off posing models you know very much in line with the kind of pictures he was going to produce and then there's a, a clear divergence <laughs> that the photos he's taking bear no relation to pictures that he's producing Sanborn's rude pictures were circulated amongst a small group of like-minded men his private vice was tolerated, provided it stayed within a gentleman's club of friends. <laughs> but for Victorians, more public displays of photographed nudity were another matter entirely. I think there was a degree of aversion to this kind of, of nudity. One could have nudity when you are depicting historical moments, when you are depicting the age of Rome and the age of Greece and these former eras of decadence, and even then uh, it had to be done carefully, to have modern nudity was an altogether more challenging idea. In 1857, Dutch artist Oscar Rylander became involved in this debate when he used nude models in his photographic tableau the two ways of life. 
Oscar Rylander's photograph, The Two Ways of Life, was exhibited at the Manchester Art Treasures exhibition in 1857. And it was actually quite a complex image. It wasn't um, a single negative, a single image. It was actually a composite of um, nearly 30 different images that he put together. He wanted to create a high art photograph. High art or not, this picture posed problems for Victorian guardians of taste and decency. Because it included a number of, of unclothed uh, female figures, a number of critics felt this, this was actually an inappropriate subject matter. Therefore, the image itself was vulgar. Now, in an extraordinary twist, the Queen herself endorsed the picture. Victoria was no prude. Her marriage to Prince Albert was intensely sexual. So when she saw the two ways of life, she bought it. The perfect present for her husband. Danke, mein Lieben. But photography could never be an exclusive medium just for the upper class elite. It was much more democratic. And that made it a threat. A single negative could create thousands of positive images. These could be sold cheaply. Rude photographs became affordable and available, and selling them was a furtive but lucrative business. There were certain places that you went, there would be tip-offs, there would be people who would have new stocks arriving from Paris, and if you were part of one of those networks, you would know where to go. The place to go for all this rudeness in London, a hundred years before the heyday of Soho, was Hollywell Street, near the Strand. This was described in a letter to the Times in 1857 as the most evil street in the civilised world. You walk down Hollywell Street, you would see bookshop after bookshop after bookshop, all of which had prints, photographs, images for, for uh, there to buy that would have been kind of pornographic or semi-pornographic. Anybody um, could walk down this street and be confronted, even if they hadn't asked for them specially, confronted with these images upon display in the windows or inside the shop. Nervousness became moral panic when rude photography went from titillating to hardcore. In 1857, politicians decided to act. Parliament passed an Obscene Publications Act to stop these dangerous images ever getting into the wrong hands. The key element in understanding debates about obscenity in the Victorian period is that it, they're really debates about who looks at images rather than the images themselves. The two groups who are seen to be most vulnerable to these influences are young working class men who might by the 1860s have um, an income that would allow them to buy these kinds of images and more particularly women of all classes who are simply believed to be inappropriate as an audience for any kind of sexualized imagery. <gasps> But it wasn't only the rude threat of mass-produced photographs that was causing concern. Into the second half of the 19th century, a new urban and industrial culture of work was in turn creating a popular culture of leisure. Increasing incomes and levels of literacy meant new demand for reading matter of all kinds. New print technology created a mass media of cheap newspapers. But to the dismay of moral reformers, common people showed a liking for papers filled with sex and crime. These people were absolutely outraged to find that what the working class did with their education was to read things like the illustrated 
police news and to read all sorts of material which was anything but elevated. Oh, my God! The rude weeklies were a combination of words and pictures that shocked and entertained in equal measure. They were just looking at um, awful cruelty to an idiot boy. There's no justification for that story at all. Uh, they're showing a kid being thrown onto the fire by, you know, ungracious parents. <laughs> ah, mama, why? By the time you get to the Ripper murders, they had no access to the photos, so they speculated on images. Well, they just made stuff up. We provided probably the best images. We'll just make it up. You know, who knows? Police don't care. No one cares. You know, it's a, it's a big story. One article in the upmarket Pall Mall Gazette of 1870 condemned this most vulgar journalism. Illustrated Police News is a hideous production. They move the heart with murder, inflame it with arson, tickle it with intrigue. Another cheap publication with the same kind of appeal to working class readers was the comic. And one of the first comics to appear had rude, cheeky chappy Ali Sloper as its cover star. <laughs> Most frequently kicked out man in Europe. Ali Sloper's Half Holiday was first published in 1884 and was soon selling 350,000 copies a week. He was a con man, he was a drunkard, um, degenerate in many ways, um, and his name, of course, came from his tendency to slope down the alley to avoid the rent collector. <laughs> He glorified in drink and sex. He always had a bottle of gin protruding from his coat pocket. Sometimes he went on the wagon, um, protested his horror of drink. In that way, he echoed some of the, the language of the reformers and also parodied them. Guy slightly dressed anachronistically, his clothes, that weird stovepipe hat he wore, he had a gin blossom nose, so you knew he was a heavy drinker. It's fascinating, Ali Sloper's um, hat is Dickensian. Uh, it's almost like a kind of crumpled Regency hat. He's goatish, and the most obvious demonstration of this is this huge ravaged nose, which is quite plainly phallic. Phallic imagery and symbolism is everywhere in Music Hall Rude and the Rude of popular culture, but this is striking, and it's mimicked in other features which you see in the cartoons, like the, the erectile tissue of, of a horse's tail. And his umbrella, to a degree, is um, phallic. The big ears of a, a very, very old man or someone who's... Uh constantly listening in on other people's uh, conversations. It's really uh, a face only a blind mother could love, frankly. By the 1880s, employers were giving their workers Saturday afternoons off. The half holiday of the comic's title. So Ali showed readers the rude pleasures to be had in this liberation from the working week. Ali Sloper's Half Holiday, the very name, refers to the Saturday Half Holiday for the working classes, for the mass of the population. The idea of the weekend is coming up. This is a periodical devoted to the weekend. Ali's drunken gate-crashing of high society also gave his fans the satisfaction of seeing one of their own larging it with the toffs. And it's perhaps the first time in print that there has been acceptance of what the mass of the population actually does in its leisure time, when it lets its hair down, when it drinks, and when it enjoys the weekend. You can kind of see a route for uh, 
W.C. Fields in his image as well. It is quite, um, it's a kind of antisocial set expression on his, uh, on his face. In the 1890s, Ali Sloper had such celebrity that he was being played on music hall stages. But by now, it wasn't only swells and proles who were flocking to what had become the most lucrative entertainment business in Britain. Proprietors were trying to broaden the appeal of the music hall and attract the middle class to bigger, ever more ornate pleasure domes. So owners felt a need to control the rowdiness and rudeness that was always the essence of music hall. The audience are fed into these houses more expeditiously. They are all now uh, more disciplined. They all face the front. There were controls upon artists in terms of what they could or could not say. These were house rules, forbid anything offensive allusions to royalty, to religion, or any kind of vulgarization uh, on pain of dismissal. And the audiences also were patrolled by uniforms officials who cut down on any attempt to at shouting, booing, or hissing. Shh. In this more cautious atmosphere, performers had to employ strategies of nods and winks to give their audiences what they still really wanted. A good bawdy night out. Someone with a genius for the rude innuendo now needed was Victorian superstar Mari Lloyd. Now come on everybody, join in the chorus. You know it's sad, don't you? We need before. Here we go. A regular farmer's daughter thought she'd like to come to town. But what did she know about railways? <laughs> you couldn't be out and out terribly, terribly uh, lewd, but you could be suggestive. Um, and so I think what, what built up was a language of suggestiveness. Now, Mary Lloyd is the one that, that everybody knows about because she wiggled her hips. She did her look over her shoulder. She winked. And all of that sort of built up this, the, the persona of, of the... Uh, the good time girl, the naughty girl. And she told the woman she never had a ticket punch before. <laughs> Mari Lloyd loved to play teasing, rude games. One of her songs was the sugary Victorian favourite, Come Into the Garden, Maud. Come into the garden, Maud. Where the black bat night has flown. Mari, through her suggestive performance, gave the song a completely new, lewd meaning. Come into the garden, Lord. I am here by the gate alone. Despite attempts to create a more respectable image for their business, owners hypocritically turned a blind eye to the rude reality that music halls were still places for prostitution. Soliciting on the promenade, a meeting place at the back of the music hall, was commonplace. In the music hall, managers claimed that they exercised a growing sense of moral vigilance to exclude the volunteers of Venus, women of a so-called light character. But in fact, they endorsed their presence. Mari Lloyd cheekily confronted owners and audiences about the illicit goings on around them, playing a lady of the night in a provocative piece of melodrama. Since Mother Eve in the garden long ago Started a fashion, fashion's been a passion Eve wore a costume you Now, the presence of prostitutes in the audience, it also gave extra point to many of the songs, an extra kind of sexual resonance. And these were songs which mimicked the soliciting techniques of prostitutes. 
Do you like my dress just a little bit? It's the little bit the boys adore. Uh, when I take my morning promenade, quite a fashion card on the promenade. No, I don't mind nice boys staring hard if it fascinates their desire. Do you think my dress is a little bit, just a little bit? Well, not that much of it. Ha, now it shows my shape just a little bit. That's the little bit the boys admire. Victorian moral reformers argued that music halls linked to prostitution were part of an exploitation of women, undermining the morals of the nation. By the 1890s, they had put pressure on local councils across Britain to set up watch committees to keep an eye on theatres and vet performers. The leader of the campaign to clean up rude music hall was Mrs. Ormiston Chant, head of the National Vigilance Society. She is a progressive figure. We should not dismiss her as a Mrs. Grundy. She's the sort of woman who got women in this country the vote. She's not a backward-looking person. She's not somebody who just wants to spoil people's fun. She's an activist. In 1894, Almost Enchant took on one of the biggest and most profitable theatres in the country, speaking out against the Empire Leicester Square, London. The place at night is the habitual resort of prostitutes in pursuit of their traffic. Portions of the entertainment are most objectionable, obnoxious and against the best interests and moral well-being of the community at large. This crusade to clean up the music hall prompted one eminent and aristocratic young Victorian to do battle. Winston Churchill, who was a cadet at Sandhurst during this period, felt strongly enough about the pleasures that he had had in the promenade to make what is effectively his unofficial maiden speech, a speech against uh, Mrs Ormiston Chant. Where does the Englishman in London always find a welcome? Where does he first go when battle-scarred and travel-worn he reaches home? Who is always there to greet him with a smile and join him with a drink? Who is ever faithful, ever true? The ladies of the Empire Promenade. And he meant that, he meant that. He practiced a speech on the way that he didn't use. That is straight from the heart. Ormiston Chant's campaign had only limited success. The empire was closed for two weeks before opening again for business as usual. A new century saw the battle between rude and prude continue. Victoria may have died in 1901, but the Victorian values claimed in her name lived on into a new Edwardian age and beyond. And the tensions between Rood and its opponents would increasingly take place in a mass culture of entertainment and leisure. What you see in the city is really the development of what we would recognize as a, as a modern mass culture. Modern systems of transport which bring people together, omnibuses, tubes, the trams. Modern leisure, football is going to be a uh, booming uh, public sport. And with that also, rising real incomes uh, for the working class. And the factory acts, the, the acts giving bank holidays means that they now have leisure time uh, and they have money to spend in the leisure time. So they're going to spend that on holidays. The most popular holiday destination became the seaside, previously the preserve of the upper and middle classes. Workers began to flock to resorts like Blackpool for the one week of unpaid holiday now given to them.
At the start of the 19th century, a few thousand people would go to Blackpool. By the end of the 19th century, you've got two million, three million. By the start of the First World War, four million. It's quite an amazing proportion of people who would go to Blackpool. It's because Blackpool is founded because of the industrial holidays, so the Wakes Weeks. When they had their week off, which they didn't get paid for, but they got a week off or two weeks off, the, the industrial calendar would allow each town to have their Wakes Week, so each town would take their holiday, go on the train to Blackpool. At Blackpool, you could enjoy your very own rude carnival by the sea. The seaside holiday is a place to be rude. You can forget that you're doing this terrible job in a cotton factory in Lancashire. You can go to Blackpool, you can get drunk every night, you haven't got a dress quite so respectably. There are still, you know, grades of, of good and bad behaviour at the seaside. But in general, there's much more space for bad behaviour. At the seaside, you could find all manner of rude delights. Some old, some new. By the Edwardian era, there was a new kind of peep show, the mutoscope. The mutoscope is really the form of what the butler saw. They were um, instruments the viewer stood and peered into and which, in a way, sort of closed off the outside world. You press your head to an eyepiece, turn the handle and watch these images move. Looking into these machines, holiday makers were in for a rude surprise. <gasps> when the picture started to move, that was real transformation of people's relationship to images. And it was a kind of fascination. It was an aesthetic response to photographs that came to life. And the repeatability, the fact that you could press the button and see it again. For a few pennies, Anyone could look at voyeuristic little films like Fun in the Bedroom or Stolen Stockings. On one pier alone, there could be as many as 40 machines. A very public experience for a very private moment. There is something very intoxicating about the mutoscope. The idea that inside this box there's something that is maybe not meant to be seen, that something is something that only you should be looking at. But somehow, through the strange coincidence of light and chemicals and paper, you can gaze upon a little moment captured in time, um, and that might be a moment that, that you're quite glad is just between you and the machine. And of course, you've also got to remember that mutoscopes were installed in very public places. So if somebody, if, you know, a bunch of lads out for an afternoon's fun were standing in line at a mutoscope, they were all sort of laughing, you know, joshing each other. What are you seeing? Oi, what are you up to? So it's a very social situation, except that each person is getting their own private moment after they put their coin in. All this mutoscopic rudeness was available to anyone with a few pennies. So there was deep concern that the wrong sort could get their hands on this kind of filth. In a letter to the Times, MP Samuel Smith was outraged. A new source of evil has recently sprung up at our popular watering places. It is hardly possible to exaggerate the corruption of the young that comes from exhibiting, under a strong light, nude female figures represented as living and moving. <gasps> well, there was a tremendous furore about these, these machines corrupting the nation's morals. If the people writing those letters didn't realise there were many other things corrupt, corrupting the nation's youth, they must have been living on another planet. The seaside was also inspiring an art form that would have its own rude genius in Donald McGill. McGill took a most proper part of daily British life, the postcard, and turned it rude. I went to a party last night, Mr Smith, and I've just a dreadful hangover this morning. <laughs> Mr. 
Gentlemen's requisites? Yes, sir. Go right through ladies' underwear. <laughs> From the early years of the 20th century, the postcard was an everyday form of communication. Millions were written and sent each year. Postcards were used very much in the way that we use emails or text messages today. There were up to nine deliveries a day, and people would send cards in the morning to say, I'll meet you for tea in the afternoon, which is just unimaginable for us. Can I show you anything further, sir? McGill seemed an unlikely purveyor of seaside smut. McGill regarded himself as very respectable. He worked in a suit, but he has within him these subversive elements. I'm sorry to see so few young mothers here after all my efforts. McGill drew his first card in 1905. Over 50 years, he produced over 12,000 cards. His father-in-law ran a music hall, and its bawdy traditions lay behind McGill's rude alchemy of words and pictures. Just as the music hall may have within it innuendo and suggestiveness that are a kind of acceptance from the stage of, of the lives of the ordinary people in the audience, then McGill, with his, his cartoons, is producing an acceptance of the bawdy that's in the lives of, of all the people who take seaside holiday. I want to back the favourite, please. My sweetheart gave me a pound to do it both ways. <laughs> McGill drew on a cast of well-loved characters to deliver a blue humour that was smutty, yet also warm, without malice. Big fat ladies, busty brunettes, and of course, the dirty vicar. There's two women walking past uh, a window and there's a vicar in the window of a plant, but one woman says, oh, there's, there's a vicar sponging his aspidistra. <laughs> and the other woman says, well... Horrid old man, he ought to do it in the bathroom. <laughs> aspidistra's quite a stretch, actually, but sponging it actually makes it really dirty. And he's a vicar as well. Of course, he has to be, doesn't he? He has to be a vicar. They are situations involving often figures of sexual potency, which are generally women. A, a lot of the men in, in the McGill cards are kind of frightened by sexuality. What's obscene is often what's taking place in the mind of the viewer and the mind of the character within the card. Take this jelly away, waiter. There are two things on this earth that I like firm, and one of them's jelly. <laughs> By the late 1930s, 16 million saucy postcards were being sold every summer at seaside resorts all over Britain. Chuckling over this rudeness was a shared laughter that could cross barriers of age and class. My mum loved receiving a different type of laugh she would come out with when she got one of those from an aunt. And thinking back on them, they were... <laughs> they were about flashing knickers. Here's my card, miss. If you want a witness, I saw everything. I don't know, fun. I think that's the key thing, that there is a lot of fun in his drawings. And it's amazing. You read the postcards of the time, and it will say, Dear Ethel, you know, it'll be something very saucy on the other side. Say, Dear Ethel, having a lovely time. And you can tell from the, the style of writing, so this person is very proper and so on. And they seem to have chosen this, this rather saucy card to send to someone, and they didn't mind at all. rude seaside carnival reached a peak in the 1950s, when over 17 million people a year were visiting Blackpool. And this most vulgar of resorts now had its own rude star, Frank Randall. Frank Randall was a comedian from Wigan. He was the most raucous, um, irrepressible, terrifying figure, actually, as a man. He was a monster. 
crates of beer would be delivered to his dressing room. He would then proceed to smash all the mirrors in his dressing room, either with his empties or with uh, a gun from his collection of Luger pistols. Randall pushed the coarse humour of the music hall to new levels of anarchic, comedic invention. Frank, on stage, was wild. It's said that he had nine different sets of false teeth for different occasions, and he kept them in jam jars in the dressing room. Um, and he had papé mash ones, which, when he went on stage, as soon as, as soon as he got heckled, he'd fling them at the audience. Randall created characters to play on taboos, like the still sensitive subject of drink. One of his most rude creations was the hiker, bottle of beer in hand, belching and farting. All the time he's drinking from a great big bottle marked Olslop's Ales, and he would belch, gigantic belches. <laughs> And his famous catchphrase was, "By uh, gum, I up some stuff last night. <laughs> I sent some of this to be analysed, and I got a telegram back saying your horse has diabetes." The hiker also confronted audiences with anxieties of sex and age. This dirty old man had a strange phallic stick a libidinous prop, all the better to chase young girls. But he'd go over the edge because uh, he'd, he'd be surrounded by girls from chorus line who were dressed as uh, hikers, so they'd be, hey, gum, she's a hotten. Uh, and he'd get excited and preapic and his stick would start shaking. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> well, I'd better be going. I've just passed a couple of tarts on the road, you <laughs> They were a couple of hotten's. <laughs> I said, you're a penny for the thoughts. Ooh, she gave me such a clout across love. I said, what to do with you? I only said a penny for your thoughts. E, she said, I thought you said a penny for my shorts. <laughs> and Randall got laughs from the biggest taboo of all, death. I were at funeral to the day, a little lad come up to me, he said, how old is he? I said, I'm 82. I he said, I don't think it's much use thee going home at all. <laughs> and the carrots would get more and more obstreperous. It was very cold that morning. Limousine couldn't leave crematorium, so we had to use the ashes to get the wheels going, etc. Frank Randall's rude because he refused to behave. He took that tradition of working class innuendo, of the celebration of drunkenness and bad behaviour, and pushed it to an extreme that nobody else at that time really matched. People often compare him to George Formby. Every year when the summer comes round, off to the sea I go. George Formby was a, was a comparatively respectable working class lad who had cheeky little songs and cheeky little jokes. Randall wasn't cheeky. Randall was filthy. Randall's flair for filth made him the target of a moral crusade conducted by those eager to put a stop to the loose morals they thought had flourished during the Second World War. Frank, I think, was perceived as a threat by the, uh, the Rotary Club of Blackpool, by the watch, certainly by the Watch Committee in Blackpool. At Blackpool Magistrates in October 1952, Randall was charged with contravening the 1843 Theatres Act. He had been performing material on the central pier before it had been formally vetted. And Mr Nugent, prosecuting on behalf of the Director of Public Prosecutions, told the court. People go to these performances to be entertained and not to be disgusted. But Randall continued to defy all attempts to censor him. In Cinderella, um, when he was supposed to deliver his line, and he walked to the apron of the stage and he said to the audience, at this point in show, I'm supposed to say to Cinderella, I've come to cut your twatter off, but buggers won't let me. So they arrested him and dragged him off and fined 30 quid for that one. 
there's a myth, it's a wonderful story, but sadly it's a myth, it didn't happen at Blackpool, that Randall was so fed up of being arrested in the court cases and the hassles that he hired an aeroplane and flew over Blackpool and bombarded it with toilet rolls. It's a true story, but he bombarded Accrington, not Blackpool. At the same time comedian Frank Randall was being pursued through the courts, artist Donald McGill was being scrutinised by watch committees from Southend to Scarborough. Said to all no censor, I've got to hold my hat on. No fun, my babe. No fun. During a nationwide back to basics campaign by the government of Winston Churchill, McGill was investigated for obscenity. The young defender of Rude was now the elderly slayer of smut. She's a nice girl, doesn't drink or smoke, and only swears when it slips out. <laughs> it was order destroyed in Grimsby, in Brighton and Folkestone, in Margate, in... Stiles. McGill could be a little cute in defending his right to be rude. One can say he was slightly disingenuous. You know, for example, there's a, a famous one, a stick of rock cock, where this man is holding this enormous stick of rock in front of him, and he actually says, well, it's balanced on his knees and so on. So any phallic suggestions, you know, were obviously not anything he intended, and he never saw it before he was it was pointed out to him. For another day. In 1954, McGill, after numerous local bannings, was charged in Lincoln under the 1857 Obscene Publications Act. After a night in the cells, the 79-year-old artist pleaded guilty to obscenity and was fined 50 pounds. Thousands of his cards were then ordered to be destroyed. It's no surprise, given the, the reach of these laws, that Donald McGill is prosecuted under Victorian law, under the 1857 Obscene Publications Act. These kind of ideas, these kind of, of public morals and public morality about rudeness, about lewdness, still dictate much of the official culture and the laws on the statute book. <laughs> Yet within a decade of McGill's prosecution, cartoonist Gerald Scarf could draw a picture showing Prime Minister Harold Macmillan nude in the infamous pose of call girl Christine Keeler. And Scarf could get away with it. A rude revolution was underway. I could draw pubic hair, I could draw nipples, I could draw nostrils, I could draw bottoms, you know. They let me do what I want to do. I want to be rude. Welcome to the mass democracy of rude. Next time on Rude Britannia. You really got me now. You got me so I can't sleep at night.